Stay tuned to the end of the episode for a list of resources for the trans community, including some legal resources and recommended books. If you're listening to this podcast on one of our audio channels, head to either our Patterson Park Podcast Facebook group page or useventphotos.com slash podcast, and we'll list the resources there. Thanks. Enjoy the podcast. doing? I'm Mike Gaddy and welcome to the Patterson Park Podcast. So today I sit down again with one of my favorite people from high school, Miles Imler. On the last episode, Miles and I talked about what it meant to be trans in the United States. Today we're going to talk about growing up as a trans person in Maryland. Miles and I graduated from high school in 1987, so that gives you a bit of a time frame of when we're talking about. And he talks about both what it was like being in high school, knowing that you were trans and in what he termed two closets, moving on into the workforce and then being outed at work. It's an emotional, heartfelt talk about the heavy decisions that Miles had to make when he decided to have his gender affirmation surgery. We touch on some things like insurance and workplace harassment and bullying in school, but that's not the focus of the talk. So sit back, put on your headphones, take a listen with me to the story that Miles tells, even about what it was like to get the best birthday present ever. Take a listen. So I went, I ended up just keeping my male side suppressed after just keeping it secret for so long, gave up and eventually adopted a feminine appearance and persona. And it was largely due to peer pressure and bullying, being told too many times you have such a pretty face. Yeah, I remember in, in, in high school, you were a, almost ultra feminine. Yes. In some ways. And yes. You know, so that that was a reaction for you to cope with with um, with the the this 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 dysmorphic that's the wrong word dysphoria yeah um, yeah and, and so it was sort of a snap reaction back to to become sort of hyper feminized then I became even more hyper feminine um, the pictures I remember I shared with you that you kind of saw it but. I was more myself when I was little. My first memories of where I felt like a boy when was when I was four years old. Now I had really short hair. I wore boy clothes. I climbed trees. I was always outside getting dirty and playing, rough playing. Um, that was when I was happiest as a child. So, so the, the trouble, those, meaning that the, the, when you started to feel challenged was when puberty hit so when you were little you were more comfortable because you know you you felt masculine as a boy yes as a little kid and then puberty hit and then it kind of body development and gender dysphoria started and then i had this mismatch going on but how does somebody who's already dealing with puberty and you know, all the trials and tribulations of growing up, then deal with this, th- this juxtaposition right. in the mirror. How do you cope? It wasn't easy. Um, a lot of people, well, um, this wasn't me, but substance abuse, finding ways to escape are very common in the LGBTQ community. Um, in my case, I turned to food a lot. I had a lot of depression. Um, now, high school, I was outed, as you know. I went through a lot of bullying. and We both did, yeah. That was yeah. 
Yeah. So there was no support group. Everybody was closeted. Uh, this was life before the internet. So there was nowhere to go for information. It was just a weird time. It was hard for a lot of people. Um, the sad and scary part is that the suicide rate has always been very high in the community too. Uh, it is anywhere from 40 to 40% 40 of the trans community attempts or has thoughts of suicide or actually carrying it through. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the percentage is for the entire LGBTQ plus community, sure, sure, sure. but it's probably close to that. It's much higher in the trans community, but it's always been high. Um, but, uh, so things have changed. Yes. Uh, and you went, how long ago did you uh, go finish up your uh, gender affirmation surgery? And you did it at Hopkins, right? Well, um, I've had my first surgery in Baltimore by a different surgeon, not associated with Johns Hopkins. And that was in 2016. I started the first of my six bottom surgeries. I had six in all um, in November of 2018 at Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, all right, was the nation's first change of sex operations in 1966. Hopkins abruptly halted those surgeries in 1979, and it was done due to their psychology department, which was transphobic and being led by uh, a man named Paul McHugh, uh, the former chief of psychiatry there, who was against the surgeries and still believes to this day that being transgender is largely a psychological problem. Um, the hospital Hopkins. was once the forefront of these surgeries. So Hopkins, so Hopkins who led the way in pioneering this, then the, then really, I don't know what else to call them besides political wins. The, the, you know, this psych, 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 psychiatrist or psychologist? Psychologist. Declares that it's a mental issue and they stopped the surgeries. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just went on hiatus. They About closed. the time that you were going through your youth and having all these issues. It, yes. I didn't even recognize that I was trans. So perhaps in this instance, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. It's um, sad, but it applies. Um, but so, speaking of Johns Hopkins, they recently reinstated transgender surgeries in July of 2017 after a 38 year hiatus. Uh, and we're in our fifth, early 50s. So yeah. almost our entire lifespan, they didn't touch it. That's right. And that is yeah. a clear um, um, symptom of the larger society and sort of this, you know, hiding their head in the sand when it comes to uh, gender, um, gender identity and gender yeah. fluidity, et cetera. I, okay. And, and funny, you should say 50s because my birthday present to myself when I turned 50 was my penis. <laughs> That's the best present ever. I can say, I, I like a penis <laughs> bigger. <you know? laughs> we're, we're, I always knew we were so bad. <laughs> All right. True. <laughs> I had the surgery like a week or two before my 50th birthday. That was my birthday present. That was stage one. What would you like for your birthday? I would really like a penis. <laughs> I have always loved you. That's right. <laughs> but the timing couldn't have been better because the clinic had only opened a year before the surgery, you know, a year and some months. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, when did you fully realize that for you, you needed to take steps to affirm 
uh, your um, your gender with how you were biologic, uh, how you were, how you are inside versus how you were born biologically. When did you realize that you had to fix that? <clears throat> First, there were a lot of telltale signs and I was in denial, but starting to hear the language in the news, exposure, um, remembering Let's see, the first movie I had ever seen that featured a trans character was in 1999 with the movie Boys Don't Cry, which right. starred Hilary Swank. Okay, she played, she portrayed uh, Brandon Tina, who was a 21-year-old young trans male. He was raped and then murdered because he was trans. And this was around 1994. The movie came out like four or five years later. But right. was what was problematic with the movie was that even the main character referred to his gender identity issue as a mental disorder. Around 2014, okay, I'm 46 years old and I was having stress build because I was getting information and just naturally, I started to just question what's going on here. And I, out of fits of anger, I would hear my voice drop naturally. And it was a male voice and memories of that voice again. And it making sense and realizing that's, that's me. Um, frustration, frustration over the years, of living as the wrong person. Um, and then in 2013, uh, the previous year, Chaz Bono announces to the world that he's transgender and Fair was transitioning. Yeah. So there, Ch uh, Chaz Bono was the first actual trans male I had ever seen. Right, because before the media always focused really on 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 guys transitioning to women. Very seldom yes. did you hear five years ago about women transitioning to men. And that That's really right. Jazz. That's right. And I remember being completely fascinated by his story. I'm I'm remembering being fascinated by his transition and at the same time envious. And I, at work, you know, had confided to a coworker that I was questioning my gender. And this coworker and I had a falling out and somehow my having gender issues made it to the gossip pool because he couldn't keep a secret. And this made it to HR and was relayed to me during an HR meeting. Now, I had been outed at work. Um, I took this as a sign that it was time to act because I could no longer continue the feminine charade. Um, I found myself a therapist with a background and uh, I was just ready to talk. And so I did, and I found the therapist. Uh, he had a background in gender studies and transgenderism. I found him through Psychology Today and we began counseling in August of that year. And I was diagnosed with gender identity disorder by the end of the second visit which in was, August Which was 2014. the gender identity disorder, psychological, kind of like- Exactly. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. The word disorder is problematic. Many transgender activists and some clinicians wanted the disorder removed, arguing that GID was not a mental disorder and wanted its removal for reasons similar to the removal of homosexuality from the DSM-2 in 1973. Being homosexual was considered a mental disorder until that year. I might add is when you and I roughly were in middle school. So while we were in middle school, they were just then having a debate about being gay, being a mental disorder, let alone trans. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> that's right. I mean, you know, so you got triple whammy here, you know, oh, mm -hmm. first you're a mental case because you're gay. Yeah. Oh, well, you're not really. Then you're a mental case. Because you're gay. Yeah. Yeah. I was oh. in two closets. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I will, I will indicate that uh, gender dysphoria has, is still in the DSM-5 and was left in, even though it's the book of disorders. And the reason being, it's because it allows for access to care for patients. They still have to have an ICD code to have the diagnosis gender dysphoria so that they can get medical gender affirming care so that insurance will cover it. Yeah, so, that's, that's, and that's the only reason why gender dysphoria is still in the DSM book, even though it's not a disorder. Let's get to insurance, uh, because prior to Obamacare, yes, insurance did not cover any of this. And we're talking six figures for these gender affirmation surgeries, uh, at least. Um, so how did people who weren't Chaz Bono, oh, well, we'll get to that in a second, who weren't Chaz Bono cope if you have that driving force and you desperately want this surgery and insurance doesn't cover it, what did people do? Some trans people um, resorted to sex work for the money. Um, possibly other criminal things are leaving the country and getting their surgeries overseas where it was cheaper. Um, I knew of a clinic in Serbia, a doctor there who was performing phalloplasty surgeries and he was actually pretty good, but it was in Serbia. <laughs> I didn't want to go there. Um, <laughs> now, also for, for a long time, um, Finding qualified surgeons with a background and expertise in trans surgeries was rare in this country. Uh, there was certainly a lack of them, very few. And even when I started looking for surgeons, there weren't many available. I thought I was going to have to either go to Texas, to California, to New York, or this person in Serbia. Had it not been for Johns Hopkins opening their clinic when they did, I had someone and I, I just got very lucky. Now, trans surgery and healthcare wasn't even uh, covered insurance until between 2013 and 2015, all because of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. The he made that possible. How have things practically changed now for trans people who are coming out at work, who are, who are experiencing this, has it gotten better in the last few years or is it still this morass? Yeah. Um, well, in recent years, um, transgender has entered the mainstream and more people now have been exposed to stories about, about trans people or may have even known some or know a friend who, who knows someone. Um, so there's more visibility and there is more acceptance and support uh, because of the increased media exposure. Now the company so, that you work for, and I won't say which one it is, but the company you work for was founded by a trans person. That is, that is correct. So, and a pioneering trans person in your industry in terms of inventing new things in your industry. Do you think that made it a little easier when you were outed and going through this because of the history of your company or did that not help? That did not help. Um, now, in my department, it did not help. Company that was founded by a trans woman, get this, had a $75,000 spending limit on transgender surgeries that are reconstructive OK, for what is essentially a birth defect. If I were a cisgender male and needed to get a phalloplasty, I could get that surgery with no cap on the insurance coverage. 
So let me put this in perspective for people just a little bit from a practical standpoint. My grandmother, so we're talking a while ago, okay? We're talking, was the head of an emergency ward in Butler, Pennsylvania, very small at the time, rural community just outside of Pittsburgh. And she told my mother that there were babies born on a fairly regular basis where the doctor looking at the baby could not tell whether it was biologically male or female. And so they simply rather arbitrarily assigned a sex to that baby. Yes. If they guessed wrong, <laughs> that baby was screwed for the rest of their life, theoretically, you know, moving forward. My point is that this isn't just like we were talking about gender fluidity a, a little bit ago. Yeah. This isn't a cut and dry kind of thing, even biologically. Right. Now, those babies you're referring to are intersex, right. probably babies that possess both male and female, could be genitalia, sex chromosomes, you know. Um, I guess my point and, is, yeah. I, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's biology, it's by, you know, just whatever you're biologically born. But my point is that it's not even cut and dry there. Yes. I mean, scientists have done studies on transgender and not not just humans but in animals and exists in animals as well so there's scientific evidence that you know not only has it existed in human form since the beginning also animal form and i'm sure conservatives hate that but they don't like science either they don't watch this podcast Right. <laughs> <laughs> they see the little gay boy with his bleach blonde hair and changes everything. <laughs> yeah. Come on, click, click. You... So there you go. There you have Miles' story growing up, realizing he's a trans person, going through gender affirmation surgery, and coming out on the other side. Miles had six bottom surgeries. Six. He considered going to Serbia for his surgeries before Johns Hopkins reopened their clinic. He was outed in high school. I remember that. He was outed at work as a trans person. His role model initially, the only person he could point to as a trans person was somebody who was brutally murdered and portrayed in a movie. Chaz Bono changed that. I didn't even really know Chaz Bono's story until recently when I started doing background for this podcast. We have come a long way. And in the next episode, we're going to explore how far we've come, what it's like in 2021 now for trans ch transgender children and people coming of age and people who are having gender affirmation surgery. Where we're at, what's good, what's not so good, what are some of the resources, and sort of an insider's guide to some of these issues. So that's next time on the podcast. I'll be sitting down with Miles again. Meanwhile, have a couple of great weeks, and we'll talk to you soon.